Hey, Gabriel Lake. Hey, Gabriel Jose. Where are we today? Today, we are at the San Francisco famous bar, the Powerhouse. Although we did go to Lone Star first, it was too crowded. We couldn't mm-hmm. record there, so we went here. Yeah, I think that maybe we should actually just change the name of the uh, of the podcast and just call it like Gabriel's Go to Soma. Gabriel's Go to Soma. He said they don't know any other area, they don't know any other diverse. He's like, it's Soma. Gabriel's Go to Soma. Well, Gabriel's Go to Lone Star until the Eagle opens up. That's the new name of our podcast. Probably, but you know, it really depends on how crowded it's going to be the Eagle when they reopen. I just hope Troy's there. <laughs> That's the only person that you care about in the bar. Uh, So what did we watch today? So today was my pick and as we mentioned in the last podcast uh, the Criterion channel has a series where they they choose gay films or queer films it's called Queer Sighted they choose 10 10 films Um, this is the fourth time they've done it I assume it's for Pride I hadn't I've in the current collection, I had only heard of one of the films, which I ended up watching on my own, and I picked this film called Poison by Todd Haynes. In 19, it was released in 1991. Uh, you and I have both seen Todd Haynes' films that we like, and I wanted us to watch this film that I had never heard of. Which one did we watch? Uh, we haven't watched it for the podcast, but I think we both saw Carol. I didn't. You didn't watch Carol? Nope. Uh, then there was the one with Julianne Moore, Far From Heaven. You have to have seen Far From no, Heaven. No, I didn't. But I sing one song of the Broadway adaptation that I did on that. All right, so I take that back. We have both <laughs> not seen... Have you seen anything by Todd Haynes? I don't think so. So that's the reason why I was so surprised that you were so convinced about, like, you watch it. Interesting. How can you have not watched Carol? I mean, isn't, isn't Julianne Moore on it? No, Kate Blanchett and uh, Rooney Mara, and they play two lesbians, like an intergenerational... Oh, yeah. No, I didn't watch it. I know which one, but no, I didn't watch it. You didn't watch I'm Not There? No. About uh, Bob Dylan? Yeah, I know, I didn't. I didn't watch Velvet Goldmine. That was one of the ones that I wanted to watch for the podcast. Okay, for those who can't see my face, my, my jaw is dropped. You really haven't seen anything by him. Let me just see. Mildred Pierce with Kate Winslet, the HBO miniseries? No. I feel like I don't even know you <laughs> anymore. I'm sure, man. No, I huh? I don't. I well, don't. I'm I'm happy then to have introduced you, introduced you to Todd Haynes. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yep. All right. So, so this is my say, As you were saying, yeah. You have to give a synopsis of the plot. Yeah, but what did you pick it? Uh, just because it was on the Criterion, on the collection? It was in that collection. I, I hadn't heard of any of the films. I think Criterion Channel or the Criterion uh, Collection has very good taste for the most part. I mean, Armageddon is the one exception. Election? Election is good. Election is good. It's better than it should be. <laughs> but if it's like Criterion Collection level... But I do appreciate about the Criterion Collection is that they bring interesting stuff they do yeah. films that i wouldn't have seen otherwise films yeah. that are underappreciated i i thought we both had an appreciation of todd haynes apparently it was just me it's just you. uh <laughs> and this was his first film he's been making oh. feature-length films since this this was his first film 1991 so 30 years at this point i wanted to see what it was yeah so as you were saying this was a piece so i should summarize this a bit this is like three parallel stories is that they don't intertwine they don't have like any relationship you know in theme they may have like some kind of things like relationship to each other but they don't have like anything specific they're not characters that they repeat from one to the other uh, and each one of them interesting is that it actually uses a different genre they yeah. portray like a completely different genre so from the second that they change from one story to another because this is not about like one story another and the third it's actually like pieces of each one of them that like you see like a piece meal is like just progressing each one of the stories at the same time um, from the first frame that you see of the uh, other another story is that you immediately know what a story is going to be even before you see like the actors or the actresses is like, well, I mean, one of them is like it's in black and white, so it's pretty easy, you know, but between the other two, it's like it's a very strong cinematography style of each one of them for the first year in there. So uh, one of them is in black and white and it's like set up in the early 50s and it's a bit more of a Twilight song sci-fi horror episode where a scientist is just coming up with some kind of serum. That is about uh, what is it? Like, the style, lastiness, or the sex human drive. sex drive. Yeah. yeah, it's the human sex drive, and by mistakes, he drinks it, and then he starts like, just having sex 
with people touching them, just kissing girls, and they become like lepers and die immediately. Uh, the second story is about uh, a kid that murdered his father. Uh, it's a mockumentary. It's a mockumentary, yeah. It's a mockumentary or a, you know, like TV special about crime. And uh, the kid killed his father and then he flew away through a window. So is that this is an interview that I do to everyone that knew the child and it gives you like a bit more of an introspection about like who the child was. It was like so good or so bad, as you can imagine. And the third story is about this inmate in prison that uh, it follows his life since he actually gets into prison and then sometime later someone from his childhood he also gets into prison and they start having some ca I mean not really there is a sexual tension between them he becomes infatuated with the guy and he ends up like wrecking him <laughs> I mean I just jumped like several steps but yeah. that's basically <laughs> what happened we see uh, uh, like some flashbacks of their childhood and how the second inmate was like basically abused by a group of kids that they were like just raping him and just having sex with him. Like a, a juvenile, it, it wasn't juvenile detention, but it was like a reform school for boys that mm. behave badly. Yeah, and that power looks straight from Carol. Like when they're like exactly. doing all the gymnastics out there with that filter and, and the weird like fake set yep. that was clearly not outside. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That part is like, oh yeah. Yeah, this guy watched Carell a couple of times, you know? <laughs> and I'm not saying it's something bad. I mean, I feel it's like you saw it, but the story makes more sense than the Carell one. Even if you have like the same narration and everything, it's like it's not as random as in Carell. So we should say that that specific storyline, so you're right, there are three, basically three different movies, movies? here. Yeah. But the one that takes place in the, in the reform school, as well as the prison in the future, that was 100% inspired by Carell. Yeah. Uh, they don't exactly say that in the film, but the filmmaker Todd Haynes was very clear, yes, this was inspired by the film. And yeah. you and I watched Carell, and yep. we liked it. Yeah, we felt so like many it was... Penises. Yeah, but I also felt like, I don't know if we define it because it was before we started recording, but I think that we said it's like, at some point it feels like a train wreck that you cannot pull your eyes away, that is a... It's mesmerizing. I'm not saying that it's good, but it's mesmerizing in some kind of weird way. So, would you exactly how you described Corel? Would you describe Poison that way? No, no. I think okay. that this actually has a. I mean, we discussed that several times. That Fassbinder, he lived his life like fast and loose, you know, and he had like this kind of. Uh, diarrhea of creativity. <laughs> so it's a bit more like, okay, I need to complete this because I'm going to be the recording something else. And Carell was basically the last movie that he did, one of the last movies, yeah. if I recall correctly. So it's true that he was more mature than when he did The Marriage of Maria Brown. Which is best insane because if you compare the two, The Marriage of Maria Brown is like, this is cinema. Oh yeah. And Carell is like, yeah. this is softcore porn. Exactly, like, oh my God. And the problem that I had with Carell, it was like the script that it tries to make things like more deep and philosophical than they actually are. Like, I'm not going to forget like the line about like, he thought about topping him, but he realized that for topping someone, you have to love him. You only top somebody if you love them, but you can bottom for, for anyone. anyone. <laughs> yep, for all the sailors in town. Uh, that part, it just felt like I, I don't get this. I don't know exactly what you're thinking, Fassbinder, because it's pretty clear that you have taken some dicks, you know? <laughs> but this is weird. In, his, in the other hand, is the thing that the stories here, they feel a bit more fleshed out, making more sense and having some kind of point. Is that all of them is, everyone is like a bit consumed by some kind of poison in their lives. You know, the, the sci-fi one is like just literally a poison that he drinks, you know, and he actually turns from a guy that he was not paying attention to any women or anything into this guy that is like, I, I feel attracted to women, have this sex drive, but at the same time I know that if I kiss them, I'm going to be like killing them, you know. The kiss, actually when the story continues, is that they basically tell you that he's a bit more of a masochist. In which story? In the kid, the kid that actually murders the father. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. That it, gets dark at the end. That gets like pretty dark. But there are like, a couple of scenes there that I really like when uh, he says that, like, oh, and then suddenly, I don't remember what is the name of the kid, is that like, he came back and he met me, he saw me with Jose, the gardener, and he's like, <laughs> they have like the same resource that they use in uh, Europa. 
that is that they have like a green screen that they actually project like the recording. So it's like there is like a bit of an off thing and you see like the kid on the frame, you know, the door, on the door frame. But you see like the, the bedroom doesn't make too much sense about like how it's is like the... a special effect clearly. Yeah, yeah. but it's like, it actually works amazingly well. It actually just throws you off. I mean, more like, this is what I would expect, like, country to do, you know. Well, not country because the theme is last one trier, as he did in Europa, <laughs> you know. But uh, I I felt like, okay, that's, that's good. And the kid was like just consumed by that kind of you know, like him, because even when he actually kills the, uh, the mother, I think that there is a bit of a... Uh, why, really? When he kills the, the dad? The dad, the dad yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a bit more, it's like, okay, you're protecting your mother, but according to everything that we heard, it's like, you're a deranged person. You're a deranged person, is that you could have killed him, as you can kill yourself, as you can kill the mother, is that you don't know, you know? Uh, and then the third story, like the inmate, is that he's consumed by that passion that he had for the other kids when they were growing up, and that he never executed them yet, you know. And then there is something that is for the, I don't know, like brutal rape scene in the corridor. But was it that brutal? Because the guy wanted it, and I don't mean to like minimize rape victims, but he could have stopped him at any time. There, there's this whole thing in the in the movie that the the rapist, quote unquote, is much shorter, much smaller than the No, no, it's true. Guy. It's true. I mean, he could have defended like himself. He said partially he said he wanted the same. He wanted that. And the other guy, probably he also wanted to be submissive to that, you know, like living that kind of fantasy. Because even when we see like that, uh, that flashback, when all the kids are spitting on him, Jesus, that was so intense. Yeah. I, I felt so uncomfortable in that scene. Yeah, but it gets to a point that it's like, that, that's a little cocky. This is like the, the, the version that they could actually publicize, but it's like, this is pretty clear that they are like, you know, you're not going to be like using the dicks of teenagers. It's not a spit. <laughs> Let's just leave it here, you know. Uh, and he's actually with a smile in his face. Almost. Interesting. Yeah, there is like yeah, a yeah, uh, right, from above, right. you know, and it's like it reminded me of the best part of Interior Little Bar, that it was the uh, short that it had at the beginning. I don't know, if you remember the one that it was like the kid oh, that yeah, actually yeah. gets into the eating, uh, eating the dog poo. No, it was like the kid that actually just gets into the fight with these kids that they are playing basketball. You know that he's going to be the harass, and then at the end he smiles to the camera and like, but because oh, what I wanted. He convinces the well, he doesn't convince them, but they like beat him up and they force him to eat dog shit, that and then it, yeah. you see like the smile on his face that that's oh, what he wants. Yeah. yeah. So I, I wanted to say that between the three types, the the three storylines, they're very unique and different. And the one where he's like a brilliant doctor and he is he has isolated the human sex drive, it's it's filmed in black and white, and it's supposed to be like a B movie from the fifties, like a B horror movie, and it's clearly an allegory for AIDS. Which oh I, yeah, definitely because it's the nineties. Yes, so this came out in nineteen ninety one. Time, yeah. Um, so that has like a purpose or a meaning behind it, and I I don't know what I got from the other two storylines. The the mockumentary was kind of like quirky and interesting. I found it very humorous, to be yeah. honest. Um, and then the story in the French jail in the was it the fifties, forties? Yeah, I remember the I found it extremely erotic, but I don't know what it was supposed to show. Yeah, I mean, I had a feeling that it was a bit more of a day mate. Uh, what's it? Broom? John Broom? Yeah. I think it's his name. And the other one was Bolton. I don't remember the Bolton, first Bolton, yeah. Uh, Broom, I think that he always was in love with this other guy. And he never, like, was capable of acting upon it, you know. And then when they actually were captured, you know, they actually were in prison together, is that he decided to, but he never actually built the tools for just behaving in a constructive kind of way. So he only related to the way that he actually saw the kids in the juvenile correction center, you know? So he used the same kind of approach. And maybe it's exactly what Bolton also understood. That he said, this is normal. This is how I'm mostly going to be like getting what I want. It's being abused. And there is a scene in that specific uh, story, storyline, and that storyline is called Homo. Um, where he is, he arrives at the prison and there's this scene where another inmate brutalizes a guy that's clearly gay and forces him into oral sex. And 
the main character, Broom, I can't remember his name, he doesn't show any indication that he's gay, and I get it. You have to hide that you're gay. That's... But is that enough for a storyline? Is that, like, all we were supposed to get? Is that you have to hide that you're gay? I think so. I think there is like a bit more of a, like, a non-acceptance because of the kind of risk, you know, and even, like, the kind of... the non-acceptance uh, kind of damage it brings along to gay relationships. And once again, we're talking about the 90s. Is that it was still not like completely okay to be open in New York, San Francisco. Yeah, definitely. But it was also an epidemic happening at the same time. So, so over this weekend, I actually went and saw a movie called Sublet with my husband, um, and it's about a journalist who writes for the New York Times. He goes to Tel Aviv and he has to write. Uh, he has to write his experience of what it's like in whatever city. This happens to be Tel Aviv. After five days and he sublets this apartment from a young Israeli gay, and he wrote a book in the early 90s about the AIDS epidemic, and he tells the kid about this, and the kid is like, why, why does like, gay history always have to go back, from, go back to the AIDS epidemic? This is so boring. And the older gay was like, look, I didn't write a book about this. Like, I lived it. I watched my friends die, and like, this was my experience. I have to share this, and the kid kind of learned like how important that was. And it made me, I, I thought a lot about that film when I watched this, because I thought about Todd Haynes as a young filmmaker in 1990, 1991. I'm like, what else do you make a film about? Like, all of your friends are dying. Like, yeah. this is what you... Yeah, what I find interesting is that he, I mean, of course, he said the sci-fi one, I don't remember like what is the name that they use for that one. But it's like on that one, it's pretty clear that the analogy is with AIDS, and it's like, I feel like surprised that you use a straight guy for actually just talking about it, you know, in a certain way. I didn't way, think about that, honestly. But it's like, I just feel it's okay, you have like a gay story, like an openly two gay guys, you have like this kid that is the range, and then you have a straight guy. Is this the one that you use for it? And I feel it's like, okay, that's interesting, you know, it's like, I, I can see it, you know, but it's like you were bold for using like a gay couple, and maybe you didn't want to make this openly gay, only gay, you know, you want to make it about like, people dealing with something that is killing them inside. I didn't even think about that because for me this was always presented in the frame of this is a gay film. So I just assumed everyone was gay, but you're right. Like, yeah, he no, is no. completely straight. Yeah. He actually has a love interest. Yeah. And wow. Yeah, I feel like that's, that's a, a smart, you know, it's like it, you can actually feel like, okay, everyone's going to be gay in some kind of way. It's like, no, they're not. No, they're not. They could never say it exactly that he's gay. I mean, he got like this kind of BDSM came with this kid that he basically he tortures until he starts like just beating the crap out of him. And he's oh, yeah, him. yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's like, well, he's explaining it's like, oh my god, this, this <laughs> kid is weird. It was weird. And then he flew away. He was an angel. And nobody knew what happened after nope. that. Nope. So, I, I, now that I know that you've never seen another Todd Haynes film, I'm curious what you think, because this is Todd Haynes' first film, and he went on to do a lot of very important things. Yes, please. Yeah. Thank you, bartender. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was impressed. I thought that it was really one of his first films. I didn't want to check like what else he did. I thought, like, ah, you know, maybe like a quirky director that he died after this. And, uh, <laughs> and I felt... As I said, is that from a visual language perspective, is that I cannot think of any other movie that they have like three stories and they are like completely different genres. Yeah, no, I can't either. Well, I mean, we saw Tokyo, for example, but Tokyo are like three different directors. Yeah. With their own, they said, this is the same director just doing, it's totally like by the manual about, like, okay, if I'm going to be doing like a Twilight Song episode, it's going to be like looking at like this, is that like, true? Is 100% like that. Or if I'm going to be like doing something in prison, it's going to look like Karel. Is it true? It's exactly like that. You know, is that you didn't reinvent the wheel, but you did it perfectly. You know, is that you did it like top notch about like just hats off about like, wow, okay, all of this is what I was telling you. It's like when you see the first frame, it's not about like it's black and white or color, is that you see like how the camera is like positioned, the kind of shots that they are doing. Is that, oh yeah, that's a documentary. Oh yeah, that's a prison. I don't disagree with you. I think the film was very well done. I don't think it felt like the first film, the first oh, yeah. feature-length film. No, no, of so any no, 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 no. Yeah, no. I mean, really... I, I felt like this is this is mature. 
that yeah. was not. But this <laughs> is mature. Well, we're at powerhouse. Uh, so. Thanks so much. Thank you. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, so it was interesting because I was reading about this film and apparently it was released and nobody gave a shit. And then a super homophobic Republican senator in America lost his head because this film was made with money from the National Endowment for the Arts. And he was like, how can we possibly be funding anything like this? Because he, he didn't think queer cinema should exist. And only, be well, not only, but in large part due to that senator objecting, <laughs> this film got a ton of attention. And well, I thought, right. fuck that guy. I don't know who he is. But I do think, well, I won't say that I think this is a stellar film. I do think it's important, especially considering that it came out in 1991. Like, this had to be so powerful in 1991. And it, it must have made so many gay men feel like they had a voice, that, like, the AIDS epidemic, you know, was getting attention. Um, well, I don't think that this was, like, the first movie to actually talk about the AIDS epidemic. No, 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 but I'm just saying that I can understand if I was, uh, if I was, like, in my 20s in 1991 and I saw this film, I would be like, wow, like, other people are paying attention. That's it. Is uh, Top Hands uh, gay? Yes. That's it. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I felt like if they wanted to be like a powerful message, it should have been less subtle about AIDS. You know, I think that it should have been like a bit more about like I'm going to be like making you think in a different kind of way. You know, because the problem here is that he knows the scientist that he actually knows that if he interacts with someone, that person is going to die, and he does it. He does it willingly. But actually, when you think about it, is that that's evil. But do you think he was subtle at all? I, I don't think there's any subtlety in that. In no, that no, no, no. What I mean is like subtle from the perspective of like what message do you want me to say? Because he was not subtle on the prison one, you know? On this one is that he never says like, it's about AIDS. You know, that you actually figure it out. He's like, okay, well, I mean, it's 1990. It's, it's pretty clear that it's going to be about AIDS. But at the same time, I was thinking, okay, what do you want me to take? You know, if I see this movie and I didn't know anything about it, or I knew that it existed, you know, and someone tells me, hey, you know, this is stories about it. They say, so what they're saying is that people knew that they have a terminal illness that is going to be like degrading, sort of like just affecting them and, you know, like destroying their health. And they're oh, yeah, going nice to be, to they're going to be like just having sex with other people, like purposefully. I hear what you're saying, but uh, so if we go into the specific details of the storyline, what he has done as this brilliant doctor is he has isolated the human sex drive and he a thinks it's going to cure time. humanity. Um, and then he accidentally ingests it. And I think that in 1991, that's as much as people knew about AIDS. Like, oh, like I want to fuck other people. I may or may not be sick. There's no way to tell. Uh, people are dying, they, he didn't mean for it to happen. I feel like it was a very nice reflection. No, no, he did knew about it. That's the reason why he doesn't want to kiss the other girl. Yeah, 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 you're right. So, I mean, that's the part I had like a bit of a problem, even like, especially him being gay, like the director, I feel is that this, I feel even like more conflicted about this part. Because he's doing like something irresponsible. And it's like, if we want to find like the parallels with this, is that this doesn't actually like, really paint the best light. No, it's a good point. I should think about that more. And and in his defense, like the woman comes comes on to him and he's like, no, 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 you can't be with me. I'm going yeah. to infect you. Yeah. But like, can you really stop wanting to be loved if you have AIDS? No, no, I mean, that part is, is fair, but you can use condoms. You can actually just be cautious. There are like many, many, you know, things. In these cases that like, you know that you have this, you know that you can kill her, and you still did it at the end. And this is what I find interesting because like, you're much, much older than me, but I... And I'm proud of that. You can call me puppy. <laughs> uh, it is interesting what, I'm gonna say, our generation, I don't feel like we were as impacted as older gays that had their friends die. Yeah. Uh, so just trying to think about that and what he experienced in the early 90s, late 80s. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. I mean, I, and I appreciate like the indirectness of the topic, you know, and I appreciate like the visual language, I appreciate the stories. And without like, going into the, uh, into the questions, I think that this 
it's a movie that is enjoyable to watch, it's artistically pleasing, you know, but at the same time I feel like it may not be as important as yes, it could have been. And I feel the exact same way. I yeah. think this was a solid effort, but it, does, it doesn't exactly achieve the emotional impact it wanted to. Yeah. Um, and I it's thought... Scott! I thought a lot about uh, Darren Aronofsky's Pie. Oh my god, okay. Yes, Pie is yeah. in black and white, yeah, but yeah. it was also his first film, and yeah. it was like a tour de force. Like, I, have you seen it? Yeah. You watch the film and you're like, holy shit. This guy is going places. Yes, I want to see what he does next. He ultimately ended up disappointing us. Other, yep. <laughs> repeatedly, <laughs> to me repeatedly, as you know. What was his second film? Breaking for the Dream? I don't know, to be honest. I think that it may be Ricky for the Green. Yeah. I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's like, also a film that's like, this isn't perfect, but holy shit. Yeah, no, it's a big jump. Say. You know, it's yeah. a big jump in quality. It's like, I'm, I'm not a big fan of it, but it's that there is a progression on him. And then, yeah. And then, yeah, commercials. So thinking about that, Darren Ar Aronofsky's Pie, do you feel like if you were to see this film without any context, you would be like, this is a director? I, I mean, yeah. this director, as I told you, is like, he may not be perfect. I may still not have like a clear idea about like what is his style, you know? He said, that usually happens. He said, with David Lynch and Razor Head, like, from the first one, I was like, holy shit, this guy is crazy. <laughs> but uh, with this, I feel like I may not know exactly how, what is going to be like his language, you know, directing, but I know that it's going to be strong, you know? It's like, once again, like doing three stories in parallel, making them digestible. I'll bet you jump from one to the other, you know, and making them so visually appealing. I felt like this is a good cinematic exercise. Well, now that I know you've never seen anything else by him and that you like him, yeah, I mean, there's I like several this, yeah. films I'm going to add. <laughs> okay. uh, I'm happy you liked it. Uh, mm. It's, yeah. it's I, I would say there are problems, but they're not big problems. But overall, this film is it's interesting, it's entertaining, which yep. I think is important. Um, I was impressed. I was impressed. The questions are going to be interesting because I don't know that I would, for instance, recommend this to anyone. Okay. But okay. let's go over the question. Let's go over right, the question. Then we really like just talk quite a bit. All right, pulling up the questions right now. So Jose. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> it is you. Yep. Would you watch this film again? Uh, yes, I think so. Maybe not tomorrow, but I, I think that I will watch it. Yeah, I think there's a lot to unpack here, and I didn't get everything in the first viewing. In fact, I kind of watched this twice, mm. and, and I felt like I, I would like to see more of this. Wait, did you watch the whole movie twice, or only the scene with the dick? I watched the first half of the film twice because I started it last night and then I finished oh, okay. it and then I started from the beginning this morning. Um, would you recommend this? Funny enough, yes. Really? Yes. Yeah, and I'm thinking not about my parents, of course. <laughs> but I'm thinking about something that you said the other day that is that some of the movies that I would recommend is about recommending it to people like us that they enjoy. You know, like watching something that is not, you know, like the regular Marvel movie or whatever they want to watch and learn something. It's like, not so much from the AIDS perspective, but more about like, narratively, this is a good exercise. It's a good exercise in cinema. Is that no one is never going to be asking me, like, do you know any, any movie that they have like different stories that they are not really related to each other, but thematically they are? No one's ever going to be asking me that, but I think that this is a movie that I may, I'm answering another question, remember all the details. I'm going to be like remembering that it's good, that it's flawed, whatever, but it's actually good, good cinematic exercise. That's very interesting because my answer is no, and I'm not going to change it, but when you say, hey, would you recommend it to people like us? I absolutely would. Yeah. But do I know anybody besides you that would find value in this? No, I, I don't. That, that, that's not completely fair. I mean, I know that sometimes you actually answer this question in that kind of way about like if I knew someone like us that they like like good cinema, I would recommend it. So I'm curious about like I, we we can go over like questions because this was like a couple of weeks ago that I said like no, and you say <laughs> say I recommend to people like us, and I said yeah. But I think that I recommend this only not to people like us. As you said, it's an enjoyable movie. It's an enjoyable, it's hard to watch some of the scenes, but at the same time, it's well made. It's 
it actually just sucks you in. I don't disagree with you, but I would challenge you to name one person that you know that would like this film, if you were to recommend it. Fuck, I was going to say yes, we, and I can't remember and later, the, the artsy fartsy <laughs> part, that is like, nah, maybe he could hate it. No, I think that actually uh, the guest star that we had from the other podcast, he would like this. I think All right, he would that's like fair. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to keep my answer as no, no, no but that's... generally, I, yeah. I, there are some people, queer people, that would be interested in this. No, honestly, I think that uh, recommending it to any gay person, I think that it would be interesting. All right. So, would you, will you remember this film? I think that I already said that is I'm going to be not remembering most of the details. Yeah, this is the sort of film that, like, in a year, I, I'll be like, yeah, I saw that film, I liked it generally, but I'm not going to remember, like, yeah. a single detail about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, definitely. Even if I actually read, like, the synopsis, like, oh, yeah, there were three stories. What was happening? <laughs> so, uh, is there anything artistic about yes. it? Yes. Yes, definitely. I felt surprised, especially just knowing now that it's, like, the first movie. It's like, wow, okay, you did pretty pretty good a step here you know it's like it's true that you are not reinventing the wheel or anything but there is decent stuff happening i i thought about this question specifically while i was watching the movie and i thought god yes this is super interesting like the direction is super assured like there's something here it's not perfect but is there anything artistic about it 100 percent. yeah and i was trying to look i know he credited the um uh, the writer of Corel. Oh, yeah? <laughs> writers. Jean Genet. Yeah. But I think that, yeah, he wrote it. Todd Haynes wrote it. So, bravo to yeah. him. Yeah. Wow. Kudos. Um, is it a timeless piece? I... <sighs> From the perspective of saying that if it talks about topics that they are timeless per se, I agree, you know, because it actually just deals a bit more like with obsession and with, uh, how do you say, like with things that you enjoy but at the same time they consume you down, poisons that you actually just take in a literal or non-literal way. So from that perspective I say yes, now this feels like a movie that it was done some time ago. It does feel dated, but I would say that if I, I was nine in 1991, but assuming I was an adult, I would get the same things out of it. You were nine in 91? No. Seven. Seven. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't think I would have, if I were an adult in the 90s, I don't think I would have gotten anything more than I got out of it today. So in that way, I would say it's a timeless piece. If we were to watch this in 30 years, it would be the same experience as 2021 to me. But yeah, compared to today, compared yeah. to today, it's like if we actually had watched it in 91, at that time, at that time, it's like I wonder what would have happened, you know, how would have felt this about like, wow, this is like super transgressor, you know. But from my perspective, that this is not really transgressor. I've seen like so many of these in other like LGBT movies that is like this even feels like to calm down. You know? So is your answer yes or no? It's yes. yes. It's okay, yes. it's a timeless piece. It's a timeless uh, piece. On the topics, at least. <laughs> Would you turn this into a TV show? Uh, no. Probably not. I mean, a part of me just thinks that is at the first, the uh, black and white, is a Twilight Zone episode, basically. It's a like shot in that scene. Is there like a ton of uh, like cameras off, you know, for just distilling that feeling of, uh, of tension. Uh, the documentary maybe could benefit from more. You could actually make like some kind of uh, who kill, now where is the kid? And just make it like a mini series, you know, from a documentary, like four episodes or something like that. The other one, the prison, I don't think that you can get more than what you get here, than those 20 minutes or 30 minutes. I said, no, that's it. Then he has already tried to escape and he is all down. And he died. Yep. So usually I, I'm against turning movies into TV shows, but here I feel like there's so much. And I agree with you, the, the, the prison kind of arc. Yeah. There's not much to do there, but I feel like the mockumentary, I feel like the, uh, the doctor who discovers the 
the sex drive. I think there's a lot there. I honestly think I might watch this as a TV show. I mean, I think that also there is a bit of a difference here that usually when we're talking about like if something could be a, a TV show, what we think is like if this story could be translated in a TV show and it's like 90 minutes into a TV show that is going to be six hours, for example. In this case, it's, there are three stories. It's one of them is 30 minutes. Is it would we want to watch more of those? And the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. But if this has been like 90 minutes of only like the sci-fi story or 90 minutes of the uh, kid that flew away, I'm not completely sure. That's the reason why I'm saying no, that. I'm saying right. yes, yeah, yes, yeah. but with an asterisk because like this is a one-off kind of thing because you're giving me less than a full movie about this one of the stories. I might see that. Yeah. Uh, so could this have been better? Honestly, I don't think so. I mean, it's true that as I was telling you earlier, I think that it would have been a bit more clear about like, the message that they wanted to, to give about it. But beyond that, is I, I, I was mind blown. I mean, I was mind blown about, like, oh my God, it's like the best movie ever. But it was like, I thought that this was going to be like a pastiche about like this not going to make any kind of sense, a complete mess. And I was like, no, this requires talent for just making something that this work as well. So I would say no. Uh, I don't think this is a perfect film, but what's imperfect about it is what I love about it. This is like a first time director making a feature length film and it's messy and it's not perfect, but like you can see, this is a director who knows what he's doing and he has something to say. So yeah. I wouldn't change it at all. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So all that's left is to score it. Yeah. My score, as you actually uh, picked this movie, I think that is my channel for the scoring. I debated quite a bit internally about like, what it was going to be. And I'm going to go with a seven. Okay. I honestly was like up and down. I even like went like 7.5, almost eight. But I mean, I just feel it's, like, it's a good exercise. It's timeless, I would say. I don't think that it's perfect or anything. It's enjoyable, but the, like, the lack of clarity about like what do you want me to take from this is something that I think that it attracts, you know, from the perspective of just remembering the movie. I hear that, and I'm going to give it a 7.5 because I think this is a good film. It's not great, but it's good, and it's a very promising like debut feature for Todd Haynes. Yeah. And I haven't seen this film, but I've seen many of his other films, and it doesn't surprise me at all that his first film was like super weird and interesting and good. It's, I mean, the rest of the movies that you mentioned, they are not exactly famous for being weird. I mean, because like the one with Julian Moore is like, is this like what, like 50s story where Carol? they, uh, yeah. yeah. No, no, not Carol, like the uh, Far From Heaven, that the husband comes out as gay. Yeah, but. Uh in that film, for instance, like all the colors are super saturated. It's a very risky film. It's not like your standard film. He takes mm. risks, uh, That's it. which is That's something I, I appreciate. And yeah, I'm yeah. trying to think if there was anything else weird. Hold while I pull up his IMDb page. I'm not there. That's a weird film. He has like seven different actors play Bob Dylan. Like what? <laughs> You haven't seen him? I haven't. No, I didn't even know that. Like, Kate Blanchett plays Bob Dylan. <laughs> what the fuck? You should watch this. Yeah, yeah, I will, I will go with it. Yeah. Christian Bale plays Bob Dylan. Richard Gere plays Bob Dylan. Ben Wishaw plays Bob Dylan. What? It's a weird fucking film. And I think that this is the sort of director that, like... No, that's good. He's actually just willing to just not do the expected. And yeah, do, like, like he stuff. does weird shit and people love it. No, that's good. I don't know that. Yeah, but we don't mind. I didn't really want to watch it. Oh, he directed Enlightened. I fucking love that show. Oh, oh I watched yeah. a couple of episodes of that one. Yeah, with uh, what is her name? Crap. Uh, Laura Dern. Yes. Yeah. My my like very straight crush. I love her. Yeah. So this is a terrible human being, and she actually comes to the realization that she's a very yep. terrible human being. That's yeah. the entire story arc. <laughs> it's like two seasons, not in this video, if I recall. Right. IMDb says, a self-destructive woman who has a spiritual awakening because de determined to live an enlightened life, creating havoc at home and at work. 
It's very dis it's very accurate. It's half a comedy, but it's like pretty dark and uncomfortable. Super dark, yeah. Yeah, yeah uncomfortable. Was, yeah, it was a couple of episodes and I felt like, wow, she's super talented. And the script was like, yeah, this is uncomfortable to watch, but pretty good. But yeah. So, as this was a pick, next week is actually mine. Well, next week. Sure pick, yeah. yep. So, I actually thought a lot about what to watch next. I couldn't come up with anything. So, I decided, I looking over the list that we have of pending movies to watch. And one of the movie, one of the, the stories here that actually talks about STDs. It talks about, like, just an epidemic, you know. And I think that the best recent movie that I watched about... Uh, uh, Epidemic, well, epidemic is not, but STDs in a non direct mm -hmm. way is actually it follows. All right, and you're a millennial, so you this is from A24, so you love it. I do love it. I mean, I've seen it already, <laughs> yep. I'm looking forward to watching yep. it again. Yep, I, I watched love, it several times. It's I one. love how woke it is, that's like my favorite thing. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you used that word, I had to say it. All right, uh, anything else to say about poison? Nothing. I mean, I'm, I'm super happy you liked the first Todd uh, Haney film you watched. Haney's film you watched. Yeah, I had to say that I loved that you thought that I watched like movies with Julia more voluntarily. Well, let me add, <laughs> let me add several <laughs> movies to our to watch to be watched list. With Julia more. That's our topic. That's now that you are like away. From, you know, when I'm in Chicago, that you're going to be like just picking only Julia Moore movies. Only Julia yeah. Moore films. All right. Uh, if we don't have anything else to say about the movie, do you have anything to say to the audience? Wash your hands. Okay. Bye.